Well, good afternoon to you, and thanks for joining us here at the intersection of faith and culture. This is the Meeting House on Faith Radio. Great to welcome to the program Rachel Wojo. She is an author, a speaker, and a podcaster. She's known for her popular blog at rachelwojo.com. She has got daily Bible reading plans on that particular website, as well as other content. She's also written books, including One More Step, and her latest, which is coming out in October, called Desperate Prayers, Embracing the Power of Prayer in Life's Darkest Moments. Rachel Wojo joining us today here on The Meeting House on Faith Radio and you are someone whom I would describe as being a storyteller. You share about what God has done in your life and how that's impacted you and how it can impact other people. How have you seen God really establish you in this writing and communicating space? <laughs> what a great question, Bob. Well, thank you for having me and thank you for asking that question. It definitely is the Lord. Many years ago, when I believed God was calling me to write and speak for Him and to lead people to His Word, I began this little tiny blog spot blog that tells you how back in the day it was. <laughs> and I know that. Yes, I know that platform. <laughs> <laughs> it's it's been a, over a decade ago let's see probably 15 years and i started that blog it was called just a mom with a heart for god i had no clue what i was doing i did not know that god had gifted me with a, a very unique gift in that i found technology easy to maneuver i found html fun to write <laughs> And I just believe that the Lord really set me up for success by saying, this is the way, walk in it. So thank you for asking me that question. It's a great question. So does that mean you're a coder? I would say that I could code. <laughs> I can code. Um, my favorite code, though, as you know, based on the book I've just written, is prayer code. <laughs> oh, I like that. Very good. Nice answer. Well, the title or the subtitle of the book really refers to life's darkest moments. Mm. And I know you incorporate some Bible characters in this book, but there's also a, a series of, as we might say, dark or desperate moments that you've experienced in your life. To what degree did those kind of impact what you wanted to cover in this book? Sure. So if I only had the opportunity to write one more book, I figured I'd better make it good. And I prayed and prayed about what I should write about. And I felt like the deepest need in my own life was encouragement to know that in the dark spaces, when you're facing disease, facing desperate circumstances, looking at death right in the face, that you need to know that God is there. And I experienced his presence with me, and I wanted other people to understand that he is with us, he is available, he is ever listening to the cries of our hearts. And so that really was the, the bottom line reason why I chose to write this book. You are listening to The Meeting House here on Faith Radio. Rachel Wojo is joining us today here on the program. She is the author of this book called Desperate Prayers, Embracing the Power of Prayer in Life's Darkest Moments. What was your starting point as you began to really compile the thoughts that you wanted to express through this book? Well, I began to read... I love to study the Bible, and I began to read the actual prayers of people in the Bible who I would call desperados. Hmm. They were at rock bottom. There was no way out, no way up, and they didn't know what to do other than to pray. As I dissected their prayers and read each one individually, some of them more well-known than others, but not many of us have dissected Habakkuk's prayers, right? <laughs> <laughs> and so 
as I began to study those unique characters and what God did through their prayers, I I realized that their lives mirrored my own and that there's so much in today's culture and in today's environments that we can learn from these Bible characters. So that really was the starting point as far as a study of how to write this book. And I think... Hannah comes to mind. I know that's one of the characters that you actually portray or that you you talk about in this book. Hagar, those are a couple of characters that, and I think a number of our listeners can relate to this with respect to children and childbearing. Mm -hmm. And obviously there's a lot that can be learned through parents that are or prospective parents that are going through some some crises with respect to that overall issue comment on that if you would please well you know bob i lost my daughter after caring for her for 22 years she was diagnosed with a rare metabolic disorder at the age of four And that disorder is a very complex disease, mucopolysaccharidosis. Her particular subtype is called Sanfilippo syndrome. And the kind of cliche name added to Sanfilippo syndrome, or maybe not cliche, but it is often called the childhood Alzheimer's. So gradually every skill that has been uh, obtained in the child's life is lost. And so at the age of 22, Taylor graduated to heaven after caring for her and watching over her and watching her suffer for many years. I prayed many desperate prayers during that time. And so the mothers that you've referred to in the Bible, Hannah and Hagar, my mother's heart clings to their situations and their prayers for just a validity of my own and understanding that God sees me, He hears me, He knows my needs. And I hope that your listeners who are listening to this today can just grab onto that same hope, and that is what I share in the book. Mm. And when you think about Hagar, and I'd like for you to maybe take us into her story just a bit more, I think about, and and in fact, you even used a phrase similar to God seeing a particular person. That that seems to be a real element in that story, in her story. For sure, absolutely. So she is the only person in the Bible who labeled God with a very intimate name that we know as Elroy, which means God sees me. And she had this experience of affirmation in the wilderness when no one was around, when no one could help her, when she had been abandoned, and all she had was herself and her child to care for as a single mom. And there are so many single moms out there probably listening right now who can relate to the weight of that responsibility. She cried out to the Lord. And he answered her prayers, not just once, but twice Hagar was in the wilderness. And so this intimate name of Alroy, God sees me, is very evident of her in her life. It's very evident of how God really showed up and then showed off. He showed her what he wanted her to do, how he wanted her to live. And he did not forsake her. He promised he would make her son's nation a great nation. And he has fulfilled that promise. Rachel Wojo is joining us today here on The Meeting House on Faith Radio. She is a public speaker, a writer, a podcaster, blogs at her website, rachelwojo.com, the author of this book called Desperate Prayers. David, I know, occupies a space in this particular book, and there's a word, and we read the Psalms, and, you know, David's life has some some very, as you could say, desperate moments, and he uses the phrase in the Psalms about crying out to God. What do you find are the marks of of a desperate prayer. I mean, we should each have a prayer life where we're regularly communicating with God, but these prayers of desperation, what 
what are some of the characteristics? Or Consider this. Without God, can we have a democracy? And if religion is removed from Washington, who pays the ultimate price? Well, there's a new movie out called God's Not Dead and God We Trust. The story of a small town pastor pushed into the political arena to run against a powerful regime forcing faith and religion out of American politics. There's no better time for this movie. In today's divided culture, all of this upheaval and yearning for spiritual leadership is America's collective scream to keep God in the forefront. God's Not Dead challenges mainstream liberals in the battle for spiritual leadership, hope, and faith in America. Watch it with your family and friends. And remember the words of Ronald Reagan, without God, democracy will not and cannot long endure. Folks, we are one nation under God. Don't miss God's Not Dead in God We Trust, a Pinnacle Peak production in theaters September 12th. Elements that you've found. I think a lot of these Bible characters show us what those characteristics are, but we can examine our own lives as well. When you look at David's life, one of the times that he was crying out to God was when he was on the run from his own son trying to kill him. Mm. And so if that's not a a current reality TV show, (laughs) I don't know what is. He really needed God to intervene in his life. His own son was chasing after him, and and he had trained his son in battle. He knew what he was capable of. And at his age, I'm sure that he was thinking, this young son is going to get the better of me. He's going to wind up killing me as he desires. So that's just one scenario. There were multiple others where David faced battle after battle as Saul chased him. All throughout the Psalms, we get those uh, times of where David was in hiding in a cave or he was uh, being chased from his enemies. There are just so many um, notes in the Psalms at the beginning of each Psalm where he explains the desperation of his circumstances, or we get a little um, view into the backdrop of what was happening. I think most of us today would relate to losing a child specifically, and that is one of the Psalms that David has written when he had lost the child that he had with Bathsheba, and he knew that life was not as it should be. He knew that there were decisions that he made that were poor. Sometimes our lives take on circumstances that are the results of others' decisions, and sometimes they're our own. But either way, I think that that period of time where we don't know what else to do that is often when we pray. And the my heart's cry in this book is is twofold really, Bob. It's to help people understand that panicked prayers create a powerful pathway to peace. And that's the first main concept. The second mm. main concept that I feel that I really want people to get is to drop prayer perfectionism. We mm. all have this idea of how our prayers should be, what our prayer life should look like, and how we want to create a perfect environment or we want to create the perfect wording. And so my encouragement to everyone is that we're in those desperate places. We're really just laying ourselves before the Lord and just saying, God, help me. It's the simplest three-word prayer and yet so effective. Mm. And as I understand it, in this book, Desperate Prayers, each chapter has a three-word prayer focus. Yes, yes, it does. There are 15 chapters, and each word has a simple three-word prayer focus. And I really believed that tying those three-word prayer focuses to each chapter would help us simplify our prayer lives help us recognize that we don't have to follow anything complicated. We don't have to keep 50 prayer journals an exact right formula in order to have a vibrant prayer life. I love prayer journals, but crying out to the Lord is often our very first step. And we want to train ourselves to have prayer to be the first pick and not the final straw. Mm. 
And I don't know to what extent you deal with this in the book, but when you think about desperate prayers and sometimes I think about Hannah, she was really in that story, really having a hard time, really praying to God and and Eli observing her really either marveling or being puzzled by it. But, you know, so I think so often we we may not feel like that our prayers are are very effective. We may be feel like they're we're hitting up against a, a brick wall and we need some way to press through or or break through. Do, is that something that that perhaps you can relate to as far as just not having the words to say or just not feeling like you're breaking through. You're in a desperate situation, but you don't necessarily feel like that you're getting through. Yes. Or not even being able to formulate the words yeah. because the thoughts are swirling so yeah. wildly in our minds that we just can't even get words to come out of our mouths. And I have definitely been there, Bob. I know what it's like to sit by the bedside of my daughter and watch her suffer and die. And I don't say that lightly. I say that to help people understand that I know there are people listening who are in the same situation. You are sitting by the bedside of your loved one and you're thinking, I can't even pray. I don't have words because my mind is just swirling Mm. with these circumstances and I don't know how to process this. It's just too hard, too much, too soon. And so I would encourage that person to think about the verse that explains that the Holy Spirit, He is intervening for us. He is groaning for us. Jesus sits on the the throne of heaven and the God, the Father, God, the Son, and God, the Holy Spirit are all three working together on our behalf. But the special job of the Holy Spirit is what the New Testament promises us is that if we do not have the words, the Holy Spirit is intervening for us to God the Father. And he's saying, look at your child. Here's her situation. Let's minister to her. Shower her with your strength and mercy and grace. And the words that they speak to one another is a whole language that we don't even understand. But it is part of understanding that we don't have to have the words, that God Mm -hmm. is omniscient, He is all-knowing, and He is able to care for us and bring His presence in our presence when we trust Him, when we believe in Him, and when we Um, make the effort to open that door and communicate with him. So I would encourage the person listening today to really just open your heart to him and say, Lord, Mm. I don't have the words, but I know that you do. And fill me, fill me with your mercy and your grace and your strength to cope with my current circumstances. Well, I commend you on the phrase that you used about thoughts swirling because, of course, the enemy will get in there and he will bring these discouraging, hopeless thoughts, and those thoughts will swirl around, and we just have to really press through and shift our focus so that we can experience what you just described for us and recognize the presence of God with us in those desperate times. The name of the book is Desperate Prayers, Embracing the Power of Prayer in Life's Darkest Moments, available in October, but there's a website that's been set up. People can go ahead and get more information on that book, correct? Yes, absolutely. You can go to DesperatePrayers.com. The pre-order form is available now. There are some special bonus gifts that you receive if you go ahead and pre-order. Pre-ordering lets the publisher know that people really need this book, and then it allows us to get the book in the hands of more people who need to hear the hope in their hurting. So I pray that um, many of your folks will find this episode a blessing. Thank you so much, Bob. Rachel Wojo joining us today here on The Meeting House on Faith Radio. Thank you so much, Rachel. My pleasure. Hi, friend. Are you stressed, maybe even worried about so many needs around you that you've forgotten you are worth taking care of too? 
Well, I'm Bonnie Gray, the host of Breathe, the Stress Less podcast. I want to invite you to join me as I share practical tips based on science, inspired by God's word, to help you spark joy and restore God's peace and love to your soul. Subscribe now and go to lifeaudio.com.